Welcome, everyone. First off, I'll start off by saying that uh, I am here today uh, on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations, otherwise known as Vancouver, British Columbia. I want to thank them for having cared for these lands and waters since time out of mind. And I want to introduce uh, our guest, a VFS grad who's joining us for a, a chat today. I'm with Hannah Hall, an American actress who made her film debut in the iconic legendary film Forrest Gump, a Gump in 1994, directed by legendary director Robert Zemeckis, later appeared in Sofia Coppola's, I think equally kind of iconic in a more cult way, The Virgin Suicides, Coppola's first film, uh, and Rob Zombie's Halloween, another kind of zeitgeisty iconic film. I don't know how you managed all this. <laughs> uh, and I'm told you were born in Denver, Colorado. Your family moved into the mountains when uh, you were two years old. But you remained in Colorado until the age of 18, and after high school, you lived in Hawaii and L.A. before moving to Vancouver and attending Vancouver Film School. Yep, that's right. Okay. Hannah Hall, thank you for joining us. Hello, everybody. Me. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So I, I have to start from the beginning because your, your career is wild. Uh, you delivered, I, I think it's fair to say, one of the most iconic lines in the history of cinema. Uh, which is Run, Forest Run, and Forrest Gump. Now, I know you were 10 years old when you did that movie, but tell us about working on that film. Did you have a sense, even as a child, that this was going to be something special? Um, I mean, actually, you know, I think I was even younger. I might have been eight years old, which is pretty wild to think about when I'm, you know, meeting someone who's eight years old to think that that's, you know, that's how old I was during that experience. But yeah, I mean, I think at the time when you're a kid, you're, you just really go along with things. You're not really thinking of the long view or if something's going to be successful or not. Mm -hmm. um, it was also such a different time in the industry. It was, you know, we didn't obviously have streaming and uh, there were, you know, let's say 20 big movies that came out a year, you know, and everyone went and saw the same films in the theater and it was just such a different, you know, era. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I definitely had a sense that it was something special and, um, I also had no reference point. I didn't realize, you know, what a big movie production it was. Right. Subsequently, after filming that immediate, you know, doing a much smaller film and kind of realizing at that point, I'm like, oh, OK, this is, you know, there's a yeah. lot in between what, you know, the Forrest Gump and, you know, an indie film totally. in terms of level of production. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have very vivid memories of it. Uh, you know, it was a really interesting experience to have as a kid but I think again when you're a kid you kind of just take things as they come right I wonder we, we're like parents fans of like back to the future did like did anyone in your circle have a sense of like you know were they giddy or, or anything I mean not it wasn't no not really I don't think it you know um I mean I think you know Tom Hanks was obviously pretty famous even at that point and um you know I think yeah, everyone was just along for the ride. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Now, you were, you booked that role in Colorado, if I understand correctly. And it was yeah. kind of a happenstance that an L.A. casting director was was in Colorado and taking tapes. Yes, exactly. I mean, they did a, nas a, a, like a nationwide casting call for that right. film. Um, and then the woman who ended up sending my tape in, Nina Kether Axelrod, who became my manager afterwards, she had... Um, been a casting director in the 80s for years and she had a you know come back and forth between Los Angeles and the Colorado and she would teach kids acting and then because she had been a casting director she'd always put people on tape for you know these national casting calls so she put it in the newspaper in the town that I lived in and I was the right age and just seemed like a fun thing to do everyone you know was gonna go and do this audition for this big movie and um yeah she ended up liking me, calling me in a few times, working with me and then sending in my tape. And I think it was two months later, we got a call that they wanted to fly me to Los Angeles to screen test. Here, here's something super weird. Or maybe it's not weird. Maybe it's normal for you. I watched your screen test. I watched. Oh, yeah? I don't know if you, I'm, I'm sure you know that your screen test is online. You know, I, have, I think I've seen it somewhat, but it's been a long time since I've seen it. Or maybe it came out with like one of the, you know, the edition at like 10 year, 15 year for yeah. Scott edition dvd editions but yeah i haven't seen it in a long time honestly real like all three of your screen tests with the guy who played young forest are online and i was one i was thinking like wow they really put this kid through the like they were they were really working you out for the role but i was struck by how 
And I know that, you know, as adult actors, we work so hard to be present and to be relaxed and be comfortable, but you seemed so unbothered. And yeah. you think that was because you were a kid or, or are you just a naturally kind of chill person? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think a lot of it had to do with being a kid. And I, and my mom always tells the story when we were there, I was like, before they were getting set up, I was like running around the soundstage, like kind of crazy. And she was like, oh my God, what is happening? <laughs> like, that's not really my personality. And then they're like, okay, we're ready for you. And I would just like go and I sat down and just like did it, you know? So I don't know if I had this, I think I had an innate sense for understanding the process. Yeah. Um, but I think also, yeah, I mean, it's magical when you're a kid and you get to just, you don't overthink it. As an adult, as an actor, I I really have overthought what acting is and how to be, you know, it's like I've lost a lot of that um, natural sense, so. Well, what's your, what's your philosophy now on acting? Like, where, where have you come to? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of been an, int it's interesting starting as a kid and I don't think that acting would have ever been my choice as a artist um, if that hadn't occurred as if, you know, I hadn't started as a kid. So I don't know. And the industry has sucked a lot of joy out of it for me personally. So that's kind of why I've, I've ended up doing more production. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. It's, I, I really have, I, I enjoy acting and I actually went back um later on in like my 20s and studied with uh, Gregory Sober, so, uh, Gregory Sobeck, and he had studied um, at Yale. So it was that technique. And I had never really learned a specific technique before. And that was really interesting. And I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. um, and, but yeah, it's a, I don't know, I have a tough relationship with acting, I think. I think it's mostly just because of the industry. Is, sure. Yeah. Well, and if if you don't mind, I'd love to talk about that because I, you know, I'm 44 and I I didn't start when I was quite as young as you, but I I got my first age when I was 17, and and your statement's pretty true. It's relatable, right? There's there's definitely like now I do more writing and directing personally, and there's definitely times in my life where I feel like the joy of of acting is taken out. Now I'm just curious to hear specifically for you, what was it about it that just sort of like, yeah, what 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 bugged yeah. you? Well, I think, um, I think being, a, you know, young and take, I think I took it for granted a little bit. I, you know, I think it, and it started young when I would come home from working and I lived in Colorado and I could sense that even at very young, like at eight, I could sense that people kind of, or I assumed that they thought that I was better than them or important or something. And so I made sure to like never talk about it and so I think that you know right there that was the beginning of it you know when just becoming something that I I really couldn't enjoy because I felt bad enjoying it or I felt like it would you know I wouldn't fit in or something as a kid so mm -hmm. um and then I you know I, I think because I worked a lot in a lot of big movies and um at young I started to take it for granted a little bit and then it's like if you don't work you know, all your self-worth is a bit wrapped up in being yes. successful, especially when you're forming your sense of self as a kid. Yeah. So that got complicated as well. Um, and so I just, I think that I, you know, a lot of times I don't think I would do enough preparation for auditions and then I would not do well, you know, and then I would be disappointed in myself. And it was kind of this vicious cycle of like, sure. oh, well, I knew I'd fail or I knew. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a, it, I think starting young can make it a bit complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's interesting that even as a kid, you had that perspective that, you know, people would view you a little differently because of the stuff that you worked on. Is that, is that a testament to your parents? Cause that, that's a very like thoughtful, humble mindset for anybody. Um, I don't mean, I don't know, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I just, you know, that's, that wasn't my intention in doing it as a kid, you know, that was never like, oh, I'm going to be cool. You know, I was like, I just was genuinely um, present and interested in that. And I'd always, I, you know, as a kid, put on little shows and, you know, enjoyed kind of putting productions together with my friends. And, you know, so that was, it was just something I enjoyed, like purely yeah. enjoyed. And then it got very tainted with you know, because I didn't live in LA and I think it would have been very different if I had moved there. 
Um, I just never, I never wanted to, and my parents would have supported me if I did, but, um, and they were happy that, you know, I just wanted to be a normal kid for the most part and grow up in Colorado. So, um, but yeah, but it made it a different experience. I think if I had grown up in Los Angeles, it wouldn't have been a big deal. Like most, a lot of kids are doing that, you know? Well, there's, it's also a lot of kids, a lot of parents have these desires to like live vicariously through their kids. And they like, normally the childhood actor story is like mom and dad want to be actors and they kind of pushed it on. But it seems like your family was just kind of supporting what you wanted to do as a kid. Yeah. I, I was very, very lucky that, that um, my parents were just, you know, whatever it was I wanted to do, they supported it. And for me, it was not moving to LA and pursuing acting full time, but I enjoyed doing it. And I'd put stuff on tape. My manager actually, uh, Kather lived in Colorado for the most part. And so she would put me on tape and we'd send it in. And was, was uh version suicides a self tape or. A... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That was, that was the first uh, script I really remember reading and being like, oh, I want to be in this movie. Oh. <laughs> I loved it from the second I read the script. So, and yeah, we sent in a tape. And again, I went and like screen tested with Sophia. Um, and I had actually uh, auditioned for Lux, the um, Kirsten Dunst role initially, but I was, it was like, you know, definitely it was too young, I think for that I, to be like sexualized in that way. I don't think would have, you know, wouldn't have worked. Um, but yeah, I just really loved the project and was so excited that I got to um, also audition for Cecilia. And how how old were you when you did that movie? I think I was twelve, and I turned thirteen maybe during the during filming, and oh. it was in Toronto. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, that's I, it's just astounding success early on, like the but like these like now iconic directors who are who are there. Um, and, you know, I, there's one more project I have to ask you about, and I want to talk about the other aspects of your career as well, because like I said, you've got these three iconic movies and directors on your resume. Uh, Halloween, directed by Rob Zombie. Yeah. Uh, how old were you when you did that film? I think I was about 24, maybe. And um, yeah, I really didn't expect that. <laughs> because, and I um, I went in again at tape. Uh, he doesn't really go into auditions. He only usually hires off tape. And um, a lot of times he works with, you know, the same actors over and over. And so I remember going in taping and I was like, I don't think I'd ever, you know, be cast in something like this. And then we got the call again, like during Christmas break or something. I was home in Colorado and they're like, yeah, Rob wants to cast you. <laughs> and I was really shocked and I was really excited. Um because I had watched Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses after auditioning. Um, and I was really impressed. Like that it's actually some of my favorite horror films ever, I think. Um, just thought it was so different and really interesting. And it was like gory, but also psychologically terrifying, which I really appreciated. And um, yeah, working with Rob it was really a cool experience. Well, I have many questions, but I'll, I, first though, mm-hmm. were you a big horror fan? I mean, it's, I like horror, but I like, I like kind of campy, um, more like 80s horror, like that I grew up on. Um, it's not. Evil right. Dead, Evil Darkness kind of. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I like it, but it's definitely not my favorite genre. Okay. Um, which I've mentioned before, like horror film conventions and their, the fans are very, very dedicated. And <laughs> so. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm sure after being part of like canon for Halloween, you get invited to a bunch of conventions and horror festivals. And what, what can you talk a little bit about that aspect of the business and your career taking that interesting turn? Yeah, I mean, it's never something I expected to do. Um, but I think right before the film came out, we'd all go, and it was you know kind of also promotional, and it's really interesting to kind of see that world because the fans are really dedicated and they either hate hate the new ones or they love the new ones or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but so it was just really fun to just go and like talk to people and get to meet the fans. And um, I really got a sense of that whole world of the, you know, horror film fans, which is they're a, a really very dedicated, you mm-hmm. know, and they really love it. And so, yeah. It's kind of, it's a fun experience. <laughs> and my my cliched image of working with Rob Zombie is like he directs from a coffin and uh, he drives a roadster that has flames coming out of it up to when he gives you notes. Like what is Rob Zombie yeah. like as a, as a person? He's like a, actually a pretty normal guy. Him and Sherry are just like super nice. He's really smart. He's yeah. very creative. Like you can tell immediately from talking with him that he, 
Um, he's a real artist. Like he really thinks everything through and that persona, even that he has, that's like a part of his art, you know? Right. Um, and so, yeah, just he's everyone like the, I could tell the crew was really loved working with him, all the actors, anyone, any actor that I've ever met, you know, who has worked with him, loves him. Um, and he just, he engages you in the creative process and yeah, he's really thought everything through, which I really admire and appreciate. It's not just like throwing stuff together, you know, it's a very thoughtful person. Hmm. And he, he'd done, like you said, two horror movies before then. So he was somewhat of a I mean, emerging director at that point. Yeah. And Sofia Coppola, though, it was her first film that she'd done? She had done a short and then this was her first film. Yeah. Burden Suicide. Yeah. And did you note... Did you note a difference in, in preparation or planning or, or was she like a savant out the gate? Oh, no, she was, again, similar, you know, like very, very, she really thought every aspect out and especially visually and aesthetically, which, you know, comes across so clearly in that movie. Um, but yeah, she had really worked. On, she'd been working on that for a long time. And she actually wrote, I think she wrote the script without having the rights to the um, film. Oh. And she just sent it to the writer, Eugene Jeffries. And of course, you know, Sophia Coppola, I'm pretty sure. And it was a great script. So <laughs> it, helps <laughs> when, it helps when your last name, uh, they're like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. But, you know, she had, so she had really put a lot into that project, you know, even before knowing if she could even make it. So she, she really loved that story and you could tell too, you know, and, and I think it's such a, I mean, again, aesthetically such a really beautiful film. And that was all, all her. And you, and you said you love the script. So that that uh, beauty and aesthetic translated through the text as well. And I'm, I'm curious, what was it about the script that spoke to you? I mean, I think it was just about the characters and having women and girl, you know, especially because I was probably, you know, I was in that time of my life. Um, I really just liked the, you know, how I talked about women in a way that wasn't um, surface. And it it kind of spoke to how I felt about being a girl and, you know, growing up and going through puberty and, and, you know, this modern era. And it kind of showed an aspect of it that I don't think had, you know, you don't see very often in films. And it was dark and um, I like that. <laughs> very cool. Now, so you, you had, you started off the gate, you had all these cool experiences, success, acting, and then you just had to go and study it. Uh, another aspect of the business at Vancouver Film School. Yeah. What year was this? Can you talk to us about like what drove you to go to film school and why VFS? Um, I'd say I was probably uh, 1920, I think. And um, I had gone to university and it just, um, I ended up leaving after like a year or two. And I realized, I was like, I just want to study something really like specific. I wanted to actually, you know, decide I and I decided that film is something you know production was what I really wanted to do um you know I love I liked acting um but I also kind of recognized that you have a lot you don't have very much control over your um career as an actor or the project itself you know or your, your schedule or your, yeah your very and business so I was like I think you know filmmaking for me was like oh yeah you get to actually um, you know, you're in charge of the product, you creating your own job opportunities for the most part in a different way. And, you know, I really, I really wanted to really learn how to do it. Not just like, oh, I'm an actor. I know how to make films, you know, too, you know, which, sure, yeah. um, and so I really liked Vancouver Film School because it was so like hands-on immediately. Um, you know, this first week of school, you're making a film. And so I really liked that part of it. Um, so it was just, you know, you're, you know, you're taking all the other classes full time, but it was like, you just get in there and start doing it and figuring it out. And so that's what appealed to me. And who was the, uh, the head of the department then? Uh, the film, the, the film production. Yeah. God. <laughs> Sorry, tell me to put you on the spot. I was just curious. Or, or who were some teachers that you remember? I'm just curious to know who was, who was still there. Oh God. Um, oh God. You are putting me on the spot. Sorry, I can't. That was all good. I can't remember. It was so, that was a long time all, ago. It's all good if you can't remember. Do you remember <laughs> the first film that you did at the school? Uh, do you remember what it was or what it was about, what your role yeah, was? Yeah, it was a documentary on cross-dressing, actually. And uh, it was kind of, 
uh, it was kind of an interesting experience because my team and I, we, uh, back then it was like Yahoo message boards. And um, I went on and I was like, hey, we're like a student production. We want to make a film about like cross-dressing and what it means and like, you know, all this like, kind of, and I just was very careless about like, I had no idea about the community that I was like posting these things on. And so I came to school the next day and they're like, Hannah, you know, you guys need to come to the office. Like we've received multiple calls because they were people on the in this community were wondering if I was really a student and if I was legitimate and what my real intentions were, because they were so used to living, um, you know, basically threatened and not being accepted and not even being recognized, um, you know, as a, as a group of people that had legitimacy in any way. And so they like the blowback was really fascinating. I learned, I was like, Oh my God. And, and I went back and apologized because I really came into, you know, a situation that I didn't understand. So that was a really, and so that's how we started. And we ended up finding a couple of people who would be on camera and talk to us um, that were big pillars in the community in Vancouver. And so it was like a really cool um, film that we made and I was really proud of it. But, um, you know, that was kind of gave us a really good entry point into, you know, learning about something that we kind of assumed we might know what it was like to be, you know, in this community and we really didn't. Um, so that informed a lot of the film as well. So this might be a, a new question because I'm, I'm an actor and not a, a film director, but what is it in, uh, from directing documentaries that you can take away when you're directing features? Because to me, they seem like such separate worlds that I'm, I'm curious what uh, the overlap is. I mean, the thing about, I guess, the documentary, it's almost like you have a hypothesis about what the story is going to be, but you ha really have no idea what it will end up. Um, becoming because you're going to speak to people and it's going to start taking its own shape. Um, so I think in that way, when you're doing, you know, film, it's being prepared and knowing exactly what you want, but then allowing, you know, things are going to come up, you're, you know, someone's not going to show up, or you're not going to have a location or whatever rate, you know, whatever it is. And so being able to kind of improvise on the fly is a good skill and kind of being able to see, oh, you know, I've, like I thought I knew what this scene was about or how I wanted to film it but now that I'm in the location or see the actors being able to see other um, things that maybe you couldn't have possibly plan for okay very cool and so you did the the production program film production program at VFS uh, and then what was your next move like did you like you know, what did you do right after um so I moved to LA and kind of all you know like after film school and had all these ideas for creative projects and then, you know, spent the next kind of 10 years just continuing acting because, you know, I needed a job and, <laughs> and I had, um, you know, had already started that career and just trying to start a lot of different creative projects and really hitting a million dead ends of you talk to people and they're like, yeah, oh yeah, we have money, we have this and blah, 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 but ultimately never, ever, ever, ever coming through. And, or, if, you know, you meet people and you, you put all these, this work together to put decks together and, you know, pitches and, um, and then I did some of my own, I, you know, I directed a few plays that, cause I was like, Hey, I can be the distributor, like I can make back the money myself. So it was affordable. It was a way to just get do, do creative projects and that were affordable. Um, and so, yeah, so I kind of just was acting, um, trying to get a bunch of creative projects off, off the ground and um, and working in theater. So as a, as a fellow theater nerd, I have to ask, what uh, was the first play that you directed? I think we, we did House of Yes. Um, and then actually I did, um, the next project I did was um, an original called Astral Dick, which actually the poster for it behind me. <laughs> and um, a friend of mine from California, James Mathers, he had written um, this play, which I'd loved for years. And so I put on the first production of it in uh, Venice Beach. And then actually now I just directed um, the short film version of it. We adapted into a feature uh, summer ago and then I just finished filming the short film version of it, trying to get financing for the feature. Congratulations. That's yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and did your did your skill like see I I direct theater, 
But I feel like I'm always like, I don't know lens. I mean, you went to film school, so you know that stuff. But I'm like, I don't know lenses. I don't know this and that. Like, what takeaways do you get from directing theater that help you in doing uh, films? Well, first of all, I made, I did the theater with, like a bunch of film people so we way overdid the production <laughs> like these sets were ridiculous and like we we didn't I think I learned afterwards you can leave a lot more up to the imagination in theater than you can in film sometimes you know so that was an interesting experience but um yeah I mean I think what I'm learning now like you know working in film uh especially with the same project is that you you have a lot more latitude afterwards, like in theater, whatever goes out that night is the, is what it is. You can't change it. And so, you know, in post, there's so much story-wise even that you can do um, and tonally. So that's been a really interesting kind of transition and experience, but yeah, I mean, theater, it's, um, I, it was fun, you know, it was fun coming at it from more of a film perspective and, you know, making the production a little over the top. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And any desire to act on stage or just, or just direct them? Um, I did actually, I was in House of Yes. And that was kind oh. of my first theater, um, you know, experience in theater. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, I mean, wow, that is a totally different skill than I have. <laughs> <laughs> I like it a lot, but you know, film is so, film acting is so technical. Yes. And so intimate and small and I, yeah. 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 And it's broken up and it's not, you're not doing the entire story every night, you know, and you have to, you have to be so technical, not only just for continuity and for the camera and for whatever blocking situation or whatever, you know, what, but also technical in terms of understanding the arc of every, of the whole story of the scene of the, you know, every beat and um, how it all fits together and then do it all out of order. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's a very different skill. Well, this is what I, you know, I teach uh, text analysis in the acting school and, and I tell my actors that text analysis is, is a really valuable skill for film and TV because unlike a play where you, it runs chronologically all the way through, you got to know what your moment before is because you might be doing, you know, you just met this person and then next scene you're doing the wedding and then you go back yeah. here, second date. And I, I, I tell my actors like, yeah, you, you got to be ready to jump right in. But, but theater I find is, is great for building stamina and endurance. And I, I personally find in a lot of ways, once after doing theater, I'm much more relaxed on film set because you know that it's it's impermanent. It's not like you make a mistake and it lives there forever, you know? Yeah, that is nice. <laughs> Definitely. And it, and it's kind of cool because it's you, it's more interactive with the audience and you're experiencing what their reaction and their feel, you know, their vibe uh, directly as opposed to film where it's like you do something and then you don't see it for three years and then you know it goes out there and you it's you know it's such a the immediacy of being able to hear a crowd laugh or be emotional is such a cool experience yeah that I mean I that was a hard adjustment for me coming from theater because oftentimes on set especially if you're doing like a comedy I did a sitcom and you're like is this even funny because the crew you know they're not laughing after take 50 and you, you yeah. might record laughing but you're like is this even you don't know until you watch it with a group of people so yeah that is that is a different aspect for sure now lately you've been working as an intimacy coordinator mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about how that journey started and and some people listening at home might not know exactly what an ic does yeah so um after like living in la and just i was kind of tired of uh, doing what I was doing. Um, and I, my manager had retired and I really didn't work very much after that as an actor. Um, and so I, I met a woman and she was a, a produ line producer at the time, Fiona Walsh Hines. And she, um, she knew that I was into production and she was like, look, if you really want to do real, instead of these like fly by night projects that never kind of go anywhere, like LA, stuff oh god and um, so you really want to learn production come be my you know come work in the production office on this film and you know start from the bottom and learn everything I was like I, I would love to do that so I um it was Be Beatrice at dinner was the movie and I was the in the production office as a PA um and I loved every second of it I loved that experience so you much love, you and, loved being a PA yeah that is an uncommon sentiment. Uh, yeah, it was great. 
I had such a good time. And then um, like, like, I think Salma Hayek was sick. So I had to go sit there like, we need someone to read lines off camera. So I ended up like going and like working with all these amazing actors. And they're like, wow, you're pretty good at like little PA. You're good at like reading lines off camera. I'm like, yeah, I've had a little experience. Yeah, I've, been, I've been doing this. You've seen me. You've seen my work. You don't realize it, but you have. Um, So it was just like, I don't know, the just the film itself and like, and you know, you know my friend who hired me, it was just such a, an amazing experience. And I ended up moving to New Orleans shortly after that and um started working in production here which is where I currently live and so again I got another job as um, a set production secretary on a big tv show and um then just kind of was like producer's assistant and had various off uh, jobs in the production office and during that time I saw um the intimacy coordinating becoming a real thing and I thought that my my experience would be a good fit, which is understanding production um, and working with filmmakers and then also being an actor and doing a lot of uh, intimacy scenes uh, in my 20s mm -hmm. uh, at a time where an intimacy coordinator was not a thing. And it was interesting um, to see it become more legitimate. And essentially what an intimacy coordinator does is um, you break down the script and then you meet with the creative. So if it's a film director or TV showrunner producers. And you ask, you know, you ask basic questions, which I think it's kind of interesting. A lot of times people haven't really broken down these scenes um, as specifically as they would uh, any other or like a stunt scene. And I get, you know, gives them a chance to think through everything or they tell me what their vision is if they've already done that. And it's like, what's the level of nudity? What type of sex? How are we storytelling? What are the characters relationship? What type of touch? Like practically, what are they wearing? You know, if it's like, they're in a car and someone's wearing, you know, really tight jeans or something it's like getting those off to have, it's going to be an issue, you know, like little technical things like that to think through as well. Um, and then I have private conversations with the actors and I, you know, just check in with them, make sure that they know exactly what's being asked. Um, and if they're comfortable with it, what types of touch, if they want me to know anything, if, you know, something about the partner that they're working, whatever it is, you know, it's like a private conversation where the actor really gets to tell um, me how they're feeling um, in terms of their comfortability. And I also tell them exactly what is, so there's no surprises on set. And, um, and this kind of disrupts the power structure of like a director is going to call an actor and tell, ask them to do a certain level of nudity. You're more likely to say yes, if it's the director or producer, it's just it's just the nature of the business. Um, so it gives the actor a chance to have a conversation honestly about what they're really comfortable with. And I can go back and until, you know, say, hey, we can't do this. You know, we can't show this, but hey, you know, here's a creative way around that to shoot it. So I kind of help them come up with a plan to get what the director wants story-wise um, while, you know, protecting the actor in whatever way. Once we all agree, I do the nudity writer and then I'm on set. Okay. Yeah. I, so you're the one who drafts the nudity writer. Yeah. Uh, tip, I mean, most often. Not, I pretty much, I just put the language in and send it to legal typically. Um, sometimes production, you know, they have their own process, but because I've spoken to the director and the actors, I'm usually the one that knows exactly what's been agreed upon. Um, so yeah, often I'll kind of put in all the language of, you know, what we'll, we'll actually be seeing in the scene, what the level of nudity is, et cetera. And I send that off to legal. And how, how receptive are directors to working with, uh, an intimacy coordinator? Um, it really depends, you know, and also for actors, I found like a lot of, um, older actors that have been doing this a long time are not receptive at all. Um, really? not all the time, but some, and, and, um, you know, which I think is a shame because, uh, I mean, I did a lot of, um, nudity and simulated sex without intimacy coordinators. And I don't think, I think, I think it's to their advantage and also they're empowered now at this point. So they probably feel very comfortable, but they might not remember what it's like when you're not empowered and you're a day player or whatever it is, you know? And so, and my job is not to get in your way or to tell you what to do or, but you know, it's, I'm here to help. Like, Hey, what kind of barriers do you want? Like, can I make sure that the actor, the other actors has what brush their teeth, like little things like that. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of technical. Wait, I, now I have, I have questions now. Is <laughs> it part of your job to be like, 
hey man, maybe have some Tic Tacs. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Oh man. So the other yeah. people that confide in you and say, hey, this person had a tuna sandwich and it's just not vibing. Sure, yeah. And I get to be, I get to have a lot of uh, awkward conversations, which I find actually directors love that. They're like, oh, like I had to do um, a scene and it was like a, I think it was like a 16 and a 17 year old and they had to kiss in the scene and they had never kissed anyone before in their lives. Oh. And they're like, the director was like, that's all you. <laughs> Like <laughs> you do you take care of that, you know? And so I'm like, okay, you know, like trying to teach two children how to kiss. You know? wow. <laughs> so, you know, but that's the job, you know? And I really enjoy that part because I, if I can be comfortable and come in confidently, then I can help other, you know, kind of it's inherently awkward situations when you're just doing this type of work, when you're simulating sex or kissing people for work, you know? So I tell people all the time, you know, they're like, is it like hot? Is it? And I'm like, it is the most awkward. Like there's a hundred people standing around you. It's cold. It's like, it, it is the least erotic scenario ever. to yeah. do. Something like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I realized we might've got a little inside baseball. Someone is asking, what is a nudity writer? So Nudity Rider is a, uh, is a union contract with SAG, and I know up in Canada as well, they have a similar document. Um, it's required if there is going to be any type of simulated sex or nudity, it's required by the um, union that the production creates this rider addendum to the contract for the actor. And it explicitly describes what type of nudity, what type of sex, um, and it can be very, it can get to be very specific. Like the actor will, will not show, you know, their left nipple, but they'll show their, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so basically the, the producers can never ask for more than what's been agreed upon contractually. And so it protects the production and it protect, protects the actors as well. I mean, it's meant to protect the actors, but oftentimes the, you know, it's, it's advantageous for the production because if an, um, um, you know, it just proves that these things have been discussed and they're getting better and better about the rules, like more specific because they were a bit vague before, but you, you know, an actor has to be notified 48 hours ahead of time before they perform, they're asked to perform any type of nudity. Um, and so, yeah, it just, you know, it keeps everything, everyone in agreement about what's being asked. And an actor still has the option at any point to say no. They just because they've signed, that's something I like to tell a lot of actors that, and that's something a lot of actors, um, you know, don't realize is you could put in the, the biggest thing, you know, the most that you're comfortable with. And even on the day you could say no to it all. Um, and so, you know, you have that right up into the moment of filming once it's filmed and it's in the nudity rider, you do not have control over that footage anymore, though. That's so that is something that I think is really important to educate actors on. I didn't know that as an actor, you know, when I was younger. Oh, I don't know if it was if, if it was on record when like I started in the 90s. I don't think anybody respected it. I've heard horror yeah. stories from my friends, oh. actors friends about. In fact, I, I had a friend in a past interview who told me that uh, she had done a movie and s specified <laughs> no frontal nudity and went as far as saying don't even imply frontal nudity because she she had heard they would get body doubles come in so they would like show the actress's face cut to someone else so it looks like it's the person and she got in her rider that if frontal nudity was even implied they'd have to pay her half a million dollars per breast that was shown so that's the kind of thing that's useful for the rider yeah. And that's another thing too. If you have to explicitly say in the writer that you can't be doubled for, even for that type of nudity, if you say no, because if you say, yes, I'm okay with frontal nudity. And then on the day you say no, the producer now has the right to bring in a double. Um, so yeah, that's another important element of the contract too. So we, we do have some questions coming in and I'll encourage anyone uh, who wants to ask some questions to, to put them in the Q and a, but I'll read one here. We have a, uh... Adriana Kellerman says, how do you get a producer's assistant job when you have no connections? Are there job boards or anything? Um, I would, so I, I started working in the production office as a PA. Um, I 
I would, there's going to be, depending on where you live, there's definitely going to be certain resources like the local film office, and they're going to have those type of job listings. And I would recommend just starting at the very bottom as a PA. And it is so fun because you get to learn and see all the ins and outs of everything. And I think that if you're working with good people, their intention is to train you and to teach you everything. It's not like a oh, just go get me coffee type of position. If the people you're working with are good, they want to train people um, who are interested and who are good and competent. So, you know, it's a really good opportunity. And at that point, typically you're going to meet 15 people in the production office. And if you show up and you work hard and you, you know, have a good attitude, even in that type of role, then now 15 people are going to have your name and going to call you for the next show and you just tell people that you're interested in being a producer's assistant and they are always looking for people in an entry level um that are interested in that and if you're you know if you like I said if you have a good attitude and you show up and do your work you easily could get those jobs it really isn't you know that crazy I even tell our young actors if you show up on time you know your lines you hang up your wardrobe at the end of the day instead of throwing it on the floor of your trailer yeah. you don't act like a jerk you're ahead of 90% of right. actors who are working. It's crazy. How, like just basic decency and professionalism is like a superpower. It really is. It will, it will get you so far. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like I worked in production office for here for about four years and I met all the, you know, line producers and everyone who hires in New Orleans. And so when I became an intimacy coordinator, I told them all that, that I was getting, you know, trained as that, that I, they all called me. And so I work all the time here because I created those relationships early on. Um, it's, it's and, you know. And people, and that's, first of all, that's amazing. It's amazing. Your career is pretty astounding. Like your, the arc of your career, it's pretty wild to, to like go from where you started to like, and, and look, people listening, I don't know if you understand this. If you're able to sustain uh, a consistent career in any aspect of film, you're killing it. Like it's, you know, it's a lot of people dream to get those spots and it's not a small thing. So kudos to you. That's incredible. And, uh, you know, I also say people have to remember that it's not that people are doing you a a favor if you've worked with them before. If they know that you're a good person and they know that you're reliable, it's less of a gamble for them, you know? So just, yeah, making connections and showing up is always uh, a good way to go. People are always looking for good people to hire, you know, always. So there's another question here. Who I, I mean, I'll, we might have to answer this as a team, perhaps, because the question is, I'd like to know how I can study acting for film if I don't have too much money. There's a lot of co- colleges, but they're so expensive. I'm in Mexico and here we don't have too many options for acting for film uh, school. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's um. Uh, I mean, that's why I like a program like Vancouver, too, because it's, you know, it's a program where it's really accessible in terms of the time and, you know, doing being a year program. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I don't know. (laughs) Um, I think think take it. Yeah, please. I'm sure you have more more of an insight into that. Well, I mean, just on my end, I think whether in in Colorado or Mexico City, there's theater companies, there's Mm. acting classes, there's community theater. Like, I think on a base level, the more you immerse yourself in the craft of acting, like if you don't know anything about it, anything you do will be useful. So I would say like, just get involved with the acting community where you're at. And in terms of formally studying at schools, you know, maybe start off with a scene study class if you can't afford to to go to a full-time program. And if you know, for example, you wanna go to Vancouver Film School, I'm fully biased, but I recommend you do, we're great. (laughs) But we have scholarships that we offer. There's student loans. Like there's different ways that uh, that you can do it. But I would say just start with immersing yourself in your local acting communities. I think it's fair. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, just get out and do it. There, There's a lot of different um, classes and anywhere that I'm sure, you know, are going to be valuable and just doing it and just practicing. And you're going to learn something from, you know, any experience that you have, you're going to learn something that will deepen your craft. Mm-hmm. Well, here's a good one that I'm actually curious about. Uh, Juan Simon says, I want to be a screenwriter. However, I have no idea how to write a sex scene on a script. Does it have to be specific and detailed or just Jenny and Forrest have sex and leave it to the director's imagination? That's a great question. Um, 
I, I mean, I think it's important to be detailed. And I think what I would start with is what is the relationship of these two characters and what is the point of them having sex in, in terms of the story, you know, and then start thinking about, well, what kind of sex is it? Like what type of intimacy? Is it romantic and gentle? Is it, you know, rough? Is it playful? Is it, is there dominance, submiss submission, you know, and then I think it's more find out what the, you know, the end, the point of the scene is in terms of the storytelling and start there. So then, it, OK, now, you know, these two characters. OK, let's say it's, you know, they've missed each other for a really long time. Well, that's going to inform how you're writing the, you know, the beats. I don't think you maybe need to write explicitly like you know, he enters her at this point or whatever, you know, necessarily, but, you know, make it about the connection of the characters. And, you know, then the director can, and the intimacy corner can work out those specific details. But I think that if you're starting from that and you're, you know, making a scene that is informing something about the characters and, you know, otherwise, and if it doesn't, then you don't need it, you know? So that's how I would approach it. Now, I have a follow-up question, actually. So, I'm proud to say we actually have an intimacy class uh, at Vancouver Film School. Okay. I believe we're the only acting school in Canada that offers that so far. A little dirt off our shoulders here. Don't mean to brag. We're proud of it. Um, and uh, Sam Jeffries and Karen Mott, who are our intimacy coordinators, talk about using uh, technical descriptive language when talking about uh, you know parts of the body. Mm -hmm. Would that be something that is consistent in the States as well? And when you're writing, would you use technical, like functional, anatomically correct language? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the in, intimacy, intimacy industry here, like, yes, that we would definitely, you know, try to use that type of language um, when discussing with, you know, filmmakers about what, you know, I was like, what is practically happening in the scene? Like what type of sex is happening? Um, but I think for a script, um, I don't know that it's as necessary. I think, again, it's more about the stories and the type of connection and the type of touch and, right. you know, the type of the moment with these two characters or however many characters. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's that to me, when I'm reading a script, that is more important um, in terms of, you know, reading about simulated sex scenes. But yeah, I, I, I think when discussing it, it's important to have that type of language. So. Here's a kind of hilarious question. Do PAs get paid? Paid? <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. 100%. They, I mean, they actually, but they recently did pass laws. I mean, maybe it was like 10 years ago or something because a, a lot of big studios were not paying people, <laughs> PAs. Um, so I think it's, yeah, at least in the States, it's become like, it's, yeah, you definitely get paid. Oh, I, I don't know what it's like in the States, but yeah, you definitely get paid. And it is an entry level film job, but the hours in the film are so insane that if you get a regular PA job, you'll make plenty of money. You'll yeah. never see your family and you'll never see your friends and you'll never, you know, yeah. but you'll make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's a nice thing. I mean, that's why we're all on strike right now, right? To continue to have a living wage um, because film, and as we should, because typically, you know, when you're working, I mean, you're at least working 12 hours a day as a PA. And then when you get into other jobs, you, you know, if you're more in the more of like a department head position, you work until it gets done. You might be able to like run off and run errands and you have a little bit more flexible of a schedule. Um, you could come in a little later, whatever it is, but, it, you know, essentially you, um, you work uh, a lot of hours. So we deserve to get paid a basic living wage, you know, and I think that's the great thing about film in, in the States is that it really does provide that. Well, I, I have a related question for you, and you don't have to give me a solid number, but I'm very curious. You are one of the, literally one of the biggest movies of all time, I would say. Like, it, it Forrest Gump is always on somewhere. It's mm -hmm. on it. Like, did you get, like, the residual checks that could sustain you financially? Like, was it? Okay, I'm no. curious. I mean, the thing is, that I, w I got paid scale on that film, so you know, that's, so for that's like the, you know, the base rate that a, a, a union actor gets paid and your residuals are calculated off of that rate. So, you know, I, I, if I was, if when you're making a million dollars on a movie and then your residuals are going to be a lot higher because it's going to be based, you know, calculated off of that, whatever rate you get paid. So your residuals um, are a percentage of what you were paid to be on the set. Yeah. And it, I think it's like every, you know, every million, however much money and profit that the production claims, you know, then it's a percentage of what you got paid. It's, you know, calculated in some, I'm not sure the exact <laughs> calculations, but um, yeah. 
so I, yeah, I definitely get, I definitely still get residuals, but yeah, it's not, you know, like go out to dinner or something <laughs> every <right>. six months, <laughs> right. buy some groceries, <laughs> which hey, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I, I joke as a, as a Canadian uh, TV actor that I, I get no thanks money. I don't get FU money. We get no thank you money. Yeah. <laughs> You're not desperate, but you're definitely not driving a Lambo. If you're, but I, but Forrest Gump is such a big movie. I was I was curious to to know. Okay, yeah. um, a couple other questions here. So someone asked regarding intimacy coordination. Uh, as many more actors expect an IC, even for kissing, which used to be pretty normal, and it becomes an industry. Uh, how can how can a recently graduated actor director who probably has to do more roles, producing, editing, DPing? Uh, be able to learn this knowledge and implement it on sets. So I guess, what is the path to becoming an intimacy coordinator? Yeah, I get this asked a, a lot because it is such a new thing. And, um, you know, I was I was really lucky to get into the program that I got into to train and um, which subsequently became one of the few um, certified trainings. Um, at the time, there was no certified. So it's like the, um, a lot of people are working really hard with SAG after it to kind of create some type of, you know, certifying body or, you know, some type of standards, because right now anyone could technically be an intimacy coordinator. And a lot of people come from different backgrounds, whether it's stunts or theater, um, dance, you know, all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but so currently there, if you go to the SAG after website, there's about, I think four or five worldwide, um, certified training so you can apply for one of those and a lot of times a lot of these uh, if you don't want to do the full course you can just take different they'll offer like you know certain um, classes you know weekend seminars that type of thing so you can at least start to get a sense of what it is um but yeah I mean it's kind of the wild west for this job right now so there's a lot of different ways to get into it um and I think really just uh, maybe working with an intimacy coordinator I have a, a woman who um, a director I worked with recommended um, her, or me to her. She's has a lot, she's taken a lot of the trainings, but she couldn't get into the, cause it's getting really competitive now. Couldn't get into the full um, training. So her and I are just gonna work together and I'm gonna teach her, you know, just, she has, she's a dancer, a performer. She kind of has that aspect down like the choreography. Cause that's a whole aspect of it to make it look real. Um, but you know just the day-to-day -day, like writing a nudity writer you know what's the process of talking to the director how do you break down a script like those types of things so I've had a lot of people reach out to me kind of curious to learn um but yeah I mean working on student films working on short films that type of thing to get the experience especially if you're already an actor or director and you kind of understand how things work um could be a really good way to start a resume great for more here someone said how many hours of training have you had or do you feel you need to be qualified to be an IC? Again, you know, it's really, there aren't any specific standards right now. I think our course was like um, 200 hours, something close to that. It was pretty extensive. Um, and we learned a lot about, um, you know, gender, sexuality, uh, trauma, how to like, you know, how to spot someone who's having a trauma response and help them, you know, work through that. I'm, you know, I'm not a therapist by any means, but just like, Hey, we're on set and like something is triggering for someone, you know, like, Hey, let's get up and go for a walk. And like, let's, you know, ground reground and, you know, making that, you know, things like that available to actors. Um, Cause sometimes you don't know how you're going to respond. And if you, maybe you've had certain experiences in life and you don't, and then all of a sudden, you know, you don't expect that to come up, but it does. Cause it's a pretty, hard thing to do uh for work is to have to be nude and be an intimate with another person that you're not necessarily choosing to do that with um and so yeah so that was a lot of the training um and then a lot of like film and like how to work with you know production and how to write a nudity writer and and all of that so it was a really extensive it was like an eight month training okay um someone asked anonymous attendees said have you ever written an action scene and if so, how? How do you go at it? You know what? I personally have not, but it seems very, I've always, that's a great question. I've always wondered because it's um, when I'm reading them in scripts, like it's, it's, you can tell when it's really well done because you really can visualize each moment. And then some other time when you're reading, it's like, I'm sure that the, you know, the director really has a vision in mind, but it's not maybe so, so like specified, like every 
moment. But yeah, I don't know. That's a really, it's, that's a, I haven't written an action scene, but it seems quite difficult to do it well. <laughs> Someone asked, what route can dancers go to get in the acting industry? Which I think, I'll let you answer, but. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, some experience going and like you were saying, you know, going and getting involved, taking classes locally, you know, doing theater, especially theater, especially if you're a dancer, it seems like a really, you know, easy transition. Um, But yeah, I mean, just getting out and doing it, I guess. Do actors get paid more if they have to do an intimate scene? Not necessarily. No, unfortunately, no. I mean... You know, if you're a lead character in something and it's a very heavily, you know, nudity and simulated sex type of role that might um, inform, you know, the type of rate, you you know, you're negotiating in the beginning. But if you're a day player or any, no, it's the same, same rate. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anna Sarem, who I believe is a graduate of the acting program. Hello, Anna. Uh, Unless there's another one says, what would be your advice on getting funding for your films? Oh, I'm going through that right now. Um, yeah, it's tough, but I think, you know, we did a, we did some crowdfunding for this one because it was a short and it was, um, I haven't asked any friends or family for money in a long time. So <laughs> it's been 10 years, so I didn't feel so bad about it, but oh God, I hate doing, I hate crowdfunding. It's, it's awful, um, you know, but I think, there are a lot of different grants. There's a lot of different programs, you know, women in film, depending on what genre of film you're doing. You know, um, I got together with a really great um, indie producer, uh, Laura Cassidy, who's been um, really helpful in getting my project up off the ground. And, you know, we, we like, we've just puzzle piece this together. We submitted, you know, someone donated their winnings from another film festival if they made a film, you know, or submitted something, they got $2,000 and she didn't make a film this year because she had a baby. So she became a producer and we submitted our film and got that, you know, so it's really, you know, finding good people who understand that, you know, how to finance indie film. And, you know, it's a puzzle piece. It's like, you know, we had little pieces of money coming in from all kinds of little programs. And, you know, there are, there are a lot of really amazing um, opportunities um, to get, you know, grants and, you know, pieces of money for, you know, all different kinds of, you know, women, especially, which is a really cool thing. Um, A lot of support in the indie film world for that. Different festivals, different trainings, like all kinds of things. Yeah. And in in Canada, we do have a pretty robust granting system as well. Telefilm, uh, Telestory Hive, Canada Council, like, and and there are, especially if you're a woman or if you are someone who has been, who's part of a historically uh, marginalized group, there's specific mm-hmm. funding to break those barriers as well. So I would say, look, in, in Canada, especially look out for those. Canada is great that way. Yeah, we don't have that in the United no. States at all, unfortunately, no, no, it's all- in the same way that Canada is. Yeah, my my American friends, when they heard that our government just gives us money to make theater, they were like, what? It's like, yeah. And I remember going to school there. I'm like, maybe I should just stay in Canada. Like, this is way better. <laughs> way well, listen, we, we'd love to have you back. Come, you should come back to Canada. <laughs> um, So we're, we're coming near to the end. So I will ask, uh, uh, with your permission, I'll ask just one final question here. Um, someone said... To what extent should you rehearse an intimacy scene before the official shoot day, especially if it involves sex? Absolutely. I think rehearsal, whenever I can get it, is so great. And it just, it just, I think for the actors, I think the hardest part is like before you do it. And then as soon as you do it once, you're like, oh, okay, this wasn't as bad as I imagined. But it gives the actors a chance to um, discuss their boundaries and really work out the choreography. And it really depends on what type of scene and how explicit it's going to be. Um, I would also recommend not like you don't need to kiss in rehearsals. I don't think that's really ever necessary unless the two performers, you know, really find it that it will be helpful for them. But typically I don't really, um, you know, like to do that in a rehearsal. And I, but it's really nice to just work through the beats and like, where can I touch you? It's like, OK, you know, like and what are the moments like practically, technically, you know, that are happening in terms of the sex to make it look realistic, uh, simulated sex. Um 
And so, yeah, rehearsals are really beneficial, I think, you know, but just even one rehearsal running through the scene, discussing what the scene is and what the physicality uh, and the movement in space is going to be like, just so the actors kind of have a sense of it beforehand is really helpful. Well, I mean, awesome. I just, I want to thank you for your generosity of time and for the, the awesome work you're doing. I think intimacy coordinators are such an important evolution in film, especially like post Me Too, when we all learned about how messed up this industry was. So just thank you so much. And uh, the last thing I'll ask is, is there some general parting advice you can give to to inspire or help motivate uh, emerging film professionals? Um, I mean, if you love working in film, I think, you know, you'll you'll find a way to make it work. And it's it's really a labor of love because the hours and the situations that you find yourself in are kind of, um, you know, it's a lot that you have to dedicate, but it's so fun. It's such a wild ride. You're always working with different people in different circumstances. And, you know, it's a really amazing job. And um, yeah, if you love it, just keep going because it really, you have, I mean, I had no idea how my career life would end up and I've tried to quit film a million times. Um, and I just, at the end of the day, it was like, this is something I love. And even if it's starting again from the very bottom, it, it's actually, who knows, it could actually, that was the best decision I've ever made in my life. So, um, you know, just enjoy the ride. And uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because everyone who's worked in film for a long time has wanted to quit film at some point. It's, <laughs> it's the realest, it just is, right? It's because it's an amazing, exciting, beautiful industry. You can make a lot of money, but it's a grind, right? And it's, I, I appreciate your honesty and your candor in, in talking to all of us. So oh. thanks so much. Uh, Hannah Hall, everyone, let's show some virtual love for Hannah Hall. Let's get those oh, hands. Thank you. thank you so much. It was so nice chatting with you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Hopefully uh, I get to see your next project and maybe we'll do it again sometime. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Thanks for coming.